Among past threats to the Republic, the Great Hyperspace War stands above all other wars in galactic history. In fact, the battle we fight today is in many ways an extension of this same conflict. The Sith Empire we believe we have destroyed in this war has now returned to avenge its defeat. The historical factors that set the stage for the modern conflict bear close examination. I believe the greatest factor of all may have been the way the Republic concluded the Great Hyperspace War. The Great Hyperspace War began at a time when the Republic had enjoyed millennia of peace, growth, and consolidation. In contrast, the Sith Empire was ending its centuries-long adolescent period. Undiscovered by the Republic, the Sith had conquered all of the star systems near Korriban. They were now seeking new opportunities for expansion. At this time, a brutal power struggle had broken out following the death of the Sith ruler. Among the contenders was the Dark Lord Naga Sadao. Whether by chance or destiny, it was at this time that two Republic explorers stumbled onto Korriban. Naga Sadao seized this opportunity to gain political advantage. The explorers were imprisoned as spies, but Naga Sadao staged an attack to liberate the explorers. He left evidence, suggesting the attack was a Republic military operation. Leveraging the widespread fear of an impending Republic invasion, Naga Sadao rallied the Sith to unite behind his cause, a preemptive strike against their newly discovered enemies. Eager for war, the people embraced Naga Sadao as their new ruler. His first act was to launch a vicious assault against the Republic. The Sith armies attacked on several fronts, including Coruscant itself. Naga Sadao commanded all his forces from a meditation sphere suspended over a giant star. The initial onslaught overwhelmed the Republic's unprepared defenses. The Sith Empire's victory was almost assured, but as happened so often, the dark side turned upon itself. Naga Sadao was betrayed by his apprentice. Though the apprentice was defeated, the attack did succeed in breaking Naga Sadao's battle meditation. The tide of the war turned. The Sith were lost without their leader's direction, and the Republic forces soon chased the invaders back to the very doorstep of Naga Sadao's meditation sphere. Recognizing his imminent defeat, the Sith Lord abandoned his forces and started a chain of events to destroy the nearby star and everything in its vicinity. Naga Sadao fled back to Korriban, only to discover renewed opposition to his rule. Civil war broke out, whittling away what was left of the Sith Empire's already weakened armies. Naga Sadao defeated the upstarts, but the Sith were defenseless when the Republic fleet attacked shortly thereafter. As the Republic fleet wiped up what remained of the Sith military, Naga Sadao fled again, this time into permanent exile on Yavin 4. It was at this moment the Republic made what might now be considered a mistake. The Sith no longer posed a threat to the Republic, but the Supreme Chancellor was unsatisfied. Jedi and Republic forces were sent to Korriban and other Sith planets to ensure no remnants of the Sith Empire remained. It was this action which drove the surviving Sith to flee into deep space, with the new Dark Lord who rose to take Naka Sadao's place. The same Dark Lord they continue to call Emperor to this day. I believe this was why he led his people to rebuild their civilization on Drummond Kaz. And this was why they returned 13 centuries later to get revenge against the Republic. One must wonder how things might have been if the Republic had handled the end of the Great Hyperspace War differently. We mustn't forget, though, 
The conflict at the heart of the great hyperspace war and the war we fight today began even before the Sith Empire rose to power. I'll elaborate in the next Hall record. For more than a thousand years, the resurrected Sith Empire advanced unchecked in deep space. All the while, we Jedi believed the Sith were extinct. Though several self-proclaimed Sith Lords challenged the Republic, they were all fallen Jedi, not true Sith. The true Sith were the biological descendants of the ancient red-skinned race native to Korriban. The true Sith were extinct, except those who fled into exile 900 years ago. The success of their reincarnated civilization is testimony to the dark genius of the Sith Emperor. But the dedication of the Imperial people must be acknowledged as well. In our brief glimpses into the Empire's secret history, one name stands out. Grand Moff Odile Viken, the founder of the modern Imperial military. As a child, Viken was one of the few hundred survivors who fled to carnage on Korriban at the end of the Great Hyperspace War. To escape their enemies, the Emperor led a small fleet of Sith ships in a hyperspace jump into uncharted regions. The Exile fleet wandered in deep space for many years thereafter. During this time, Viking learned navigation and became one of the fleet's most respected pilots. The survivors finally settled on the jungle world of Drummondkos. There the Emperor revealed his vision to build a new civilization of unrivaled efficiency. And he promised his people vengeance. He promised them an empire destined to dominate the galaxy. An empire destined to bring about the Republic's destruction. The Emperor's role in Reconstruction was as visionary alone. He said to have withdrawn into isolation and left the logistics to a newly formed Dark Council and to loyal Imperial leaders like Odile Viken. While the Dark Council debated long-term plans in the Sith power structure, the young Viken took on the monumental task of establishing order. Viken drafted every non-force user of age into the new Imperial military. He then developed the Imperial Military Training Regiment that remains to this day. With his army well-trained, Viking led a campaign to carve a footprint into the wilderness of Drummondkos to create room for the Empire's new capital to flourish. Records suggest that during the campaign, he personally slew a rabid Tarant attack on the site where the Imperial Citadel stands today. After establishing the Empire's dominion on Drummondkos, Viking turned his attention to constructing a new Imperial Navy. Dividing his troops between engineering, mining, and manufacturing, he laid the groundwork for an ambitious plan, the creation of the Imperial Armada. By his own estimates, the task would take centuries. Viking knew he would never see even a fraction of his plan's success. Nonetheless, he garnered the support of the Dark Council and started the work. It was this act which earned Viking the honor of being the first Grand Moff recognized in the new Imperial military. Grand Moff Viking was eventually killed during an Imperial campaign to conquer an alien system in deep space. He died in battle on the bridge of a prototype Star Destroyer a fitting end to the first Imperial Grand Moff. Though Viking was lost all those centuries ago, his plan and his name lived on to inspire countless generations who marched under the Imperial banner. Viking's story represents the surprising loyalty the Imperial citizens show to an empire in which they will always be subservient to the Sith. I believe the roots of this loyalty lie in the events of the Great Hyperspace War. 
infamous Sith Lord Exar Kun had no relations with the true Sith Empire. But his fall to the dark side set the stage for the Mandalorian Wars and the eventual fall of Revan and Malak. As a young Jedi Knight, Exar Kun exhibited a strong connection to the Force. Through long practice, he achieved unparalleled prowess in lightsaber combat. Seeking to expand his knowledge as well, the young Jedi delved deeper into his studies of the Force and ignored his master's cautions, believing himself to be immune to the draw of the dark side. The Jedi Council grew concerned, observing that Exar Kun's thirst for knowledge was starting to resemble a thirst for power. But he was already beyond their reach. Traveling to the Onderon system, Kun encountered the spirit of the ancient Sith Lord Frieden Nad. The spirit directed the young Jedi to where he might find the powerful secrets he sought. Venturing into the Sith mausoleums on Korriban, Kun faced tests from the fallen Sith Lords. When he emerged, he had passed the point of no return. His fall to the dark side was inevitable. To complete his indoctrination, Exar Kun journeyed to Yavin 4. There, like others who came before and after, he encountered the fearsome Masasi warriors created by Naga Sadao. The Masasi captured Exar Kun and offered him as a sacrifice to an ancient Sith worm. Facing death, Kun fully embraced the dark side and channeled his hatred to kill the worm. Empowered, the young Sith Lord then enslaved the Masasi and recovered an ancient Sith battleship, abandoned centuries earlier by Naga Sadao. However, ruling Yavin IV was not enough. Seeking to establish himself as the undisputed Dark Lord of the Sith, Exar Kun attacked the craft cult of the Empress Tita system. Among the Krath, Exar Kun came face to face with another fallen Jedi, whose strength matched his own, Eula Keldroma. Keldroma had fully embraced the dark side after unsuccessfully trying to infiltrate the Krath and dismantle their cult from within. After a long duel, Keldroma and Exar Kun joined forces. Exar Kun as the undisputed Dark Lord of the Sith, Keldroma as his apprentice. Their armies, Krath and Masasi, combined to form the infamous Brotherhood of the Sith. The Brotherhood then waged a ruthless war against the Republic and the Jedi. After winning several battles, the Sith attacked the Jedi Library on Osis. There, Keldroma struck down his own brother. Osis was destroyed in the battle. The Sith were victorious, but their triumph was short-lived. Remorseful for killing his brother, Keldroma abandoned the dark side and betrayed Exar Kun. The Republic drove Kun back to Yavin 4 where the Dark Lord enacted a ritual, sacrificing his armies to keep his spirit alive. Though unable to defeat him entirely, the Jedi were able to imprison Exar Kun's spirit in the temples on Yavin 4. From what we know, it remains there to this day. We can learn much from Exar Kun's story. Of greatest interest is simply the fact that he was not aligned with the Sith Emperor in exile on Drummond Kos. The fact that the spirits of the ancient Sith Lord supported Exar Kun suggests that they did not, and perhaps do not, support the Sith Emperor we face today. We have very little information about the Emperor or his efforts to rebuild his empire in exile. Revan and Malik did not fall to the dark side in a single moment. They turned after years spent in war and in defiance of the Jedi Council. Revan and Malik's descent into darkness actually began with compassion. The compassion that compelled them to enter the Mandalorian Wars. 
Of all wars in Republic history, the war with the Mandalorians was the bloodiest, due in large part to the Mandalorians' ambitious leader. Mandalar the Ultimate sought to create the most powerful army in the galaxy. To achieve this, he had to defeat the Republic and its Jedi protectors. Calling together the Mandalorian clans and recruiting new warriors as Neo-Crusaders, Mandalore began conquering unaligned worlds in the Outer Rim. The Mandalorians fought Republic allies on many fronts, but the Republic military wasn't fully mobilized until Taris was threatened. In the first series of battles, the Republic proved victorious. Several heroes emerged, including the dedicated soldier and talented pilot, Lieutenant Karth Onasi. But Onasi and the rest of the Republic's defenders hadn't faced the true challenge. Mandalore the Ultimate was secretly holding the bulk of his forces back to test the Republic's strength. Unleashing their full might, the Mandalorians devastated the Republic's defenses and began terrorizing systems from the Tingle Arm to the Mid-Rim. The Jedi Council refused to be baited into the battle. Despite the Mandalorian's brutal aggression, the Council decreed that no Jedi should take part in the fight. As the war grew worse, however, a splinter group of rebels formed within the Order, determined to rally to the Republic's defense. The splinter group was led by Revan and Malak. Joining Onasi and the rest of the Republic's troops, Revan and Malak turned the war around. Revan led the Republic's forces in a powerful push to drive the Mandalorians from Republic space. In the final battle, Revan single-handedly slew Mandalore. He then activated a superweapon which destroyed an entire planet and everyone on it. Revan's act destroyed the Mandalorian armies and ended the war, but sacrificed the lives of thousands of Republic troops and Jedi in the process. With the war over, dutiful Republic soldiers like Karthanasi returned to their post. But Revan and Malak pursued the remnant of the Mandalorian armies into deep space. It was there, of course, that Revan and Malak found the Sith Empire. And upon meeting the Emperor, their fall to the dark side was complete. Though it became a boon to the Emperor's plan, None suspected that the Hand of the Dark Side played a role in the Mandalorian Wars. Sith Infiltrators We are now certain that the Sith Empire began laying the groundwork for its return as far back as the Jedi Civil War. In fact, it's clear that the origins of the Jedi Civil War itself were not as simple as we once believed. The Sith Emperor's first representatives to return to Republic space are well-known names. Darth Revan and Darth Malak. Revan is remembered now as a legend, a great hero of the Jedi Order. But that was only after his redemption. Revan and Malak first rebelled against the Jedi Council by ignoring orders and assisting the Republic during the Mandalorian Wars. Revan's success in defeating the Mandalorians caused the Council to question its orders but none realized how far Revan had already fallen. After their crushing victory on Malachor V, Revan and Malak chased the Mandalorians into deep space. It was there on Drum and Kos that they encountered another enemy entirely, the Sith Empire Reborn. We know nothing of what transpired when Revan and Malak met the Sith Emperor. One thing is certain, when they returned, they did so on behalf of their new Dark Master. The fall of Revan and Malak to the Dark Side was complete. The Emperor sent them back to the Republic to make preparations for a full-scale Sith invasion. Their mission was to recover the maps leading to the ancient Star Forge, constructed by the Rakata more than 25 centuries ago. With the Star Forge, the Emperor planned to accelerate the construction of the new Sith Armada. He would exact his vengeance against the Jedi and the Republic centuries ahead of schedule. The ambitions of Darth Revan and Malak grew quickly, though. As they drew closer to the Star Forge, 
the two Sith Lords began to have visions of their own empire. The dark side is strong in this place. I can feel its power. Is this wise? The ancient Jedi sealed this archway. If we pass beyond this door, we can never go back. The Order will surely banish us. Are the secrets of the Starforge so valuable? Can its power truly be worth the risk? is a lie. There is only passion. Is in position, my lord. We have heard nothing from the planet. Approaching the deadline, and the planet is yet to surrender. Revan's orders are inconsequential. Today, the galaxy shall fear the Sith once more. And if Revan doesn't have the strength to make it so, the quest to transfer you must, Admiral. But you will follow these orders, or you will pay the price. Yes, Lord Malak.
Unfortunately for the Republic, Malik's thirst for power drove him to betray his master. He attacked Revan's ship and left his fallen master for dead. The Jedi found Revan wounded and unconscious. After much debate, the Council made a controversial decision to erase Revan's memory and retrain him as a Jedi. The Jedi do not believe in killing their prisoners. No one deserves execution, no matter what their crimes. The Council would not normally accept an adult for training, but this is a special case. They say the Force can do terrible things to a mind. It can wipe away your memories and destroy your very identity. Tatooine. Kashyyyk. Manan. Korriban. Revan visited each of these worlds searching for clues to reveal the hidden location of the Starforge. The lure of the dark side is difficult to resist. I fear this quest to find the Starforge could lead you down an all too familiar path. What greater weapon is there than to turn an enemy to your cause? To use their own knowledge against them? certain the defenses of the Starforge would destroy you. But I see there is more of your old self in you than I expected. You are stronger than I thought. Stronger than you ever were during your reign as the Dark Lord. I did not think that was possible. I am tempted to try and capture you alive, Revan. Then I could break your will and bind you to me as my apprentice, as I did Bastila. I was always stronger than you, Malak, remember? Remember that day I cut your jaw off for questioning me? You will never amount to half of me. And then you betray me from afar, too scared to face me in person. No, I was prepared to face you, Revan. But fate presented me with a better option. You're only lying to yourself. You know it's true, as do I. I cannot deny your resilience. We have been inexorably pushed to this final confrontation, Revan. I see now that this can only be settled when one of us destroys the other. I think you've said enough. Time for one last lesson, my apprentice. You are eager for blood, Revan, as am I. Very well. You shall have your wish. Once again, we shall face each other in single combat, and the victor will decide the fate of the galaxy. constant war within you. My resolve has never been stronger.
You have been a thorn in my side from the moment I seized the mantle of Dark Lord from your feeble grasp. You will forever stand alone. Heads up. Uh, Im <laughs> impossible. I, I cannot be beaten. I am the Dark Lord of the Sith. No, Malak. I am. You betrayed me, and you brought this on yourself. You thought you could get to me by hurting the people I love. Yes. I cannot deny it any longer. <laughs> you are the one who deserves... Who deserves to be the Dark Lord. You were the one who found the first star map on Dantooine, Revan. <laughs> it was you who led us on our quest for the Star Forge. I only followed in your wake. I tried to usurp your rule to steal the title of Sith Master from you. But now I understand. The destiny is yours, Revan. Not mine. You are Darth Revan, Lord. <laughs> Lord of the Sith. And I, I am nothing. And the apprentice has learned his final lesson. And so it ends, as I somehow always knew it must. In darkness, I, I cannot help but wonder, Revan, what would have happened had our positions been reversed? What if fate had decreed I would be captured by the Jedi? And perhaps you would have been the victor here. I suppose you speak the truth. I alone must accept responsibility for my fate. I wanted to be master of the Sith, but that destiny was not mine, Revan. And in the end, as the darkness takes me, I am nothing. Goodbye, Darth Malak. Working with Jedi Master Bashila Shan, Revan recovered his strength. He then rescued the Republic and defeated his former apprentice. The Jedi Civil War was over, the Star Forge destroyed, and Revan not only redeemed, but celebrated as a hero. Deep in Revan's lost memories, however, hid the knowledge of a lurking menace far greater than Darth Malak. Indeed, the Emperor's plan to accelerate his return was thwarted, but the construction of the Sith Armada continued. It would only be a matter of time. With the war over, Revan returned to deep space in search of the great evil. What happened after that is unknown. Though Revan's ultimate fate remains a mystery, we have learned much about the events that preceded his fall. There are dark places in the galaxy where few tread, ancient centers of learning, of knowledge, but I did not walk alone. To be united by hatred is a fragile alliance at best. My will was not law. There were disagreements, ambition, and hunger for power. There are techniques within the Force against which there is no defense.
Something killed these soldiers. Something evil. Angry. This ship isn't as lifeless as it seems. There's the first demolition site. Planning the bomb now. Arming signal received, Mandalore. The proton core is active. Second charge placed. I, I don't understand. Where are the guards? Who killed all those men? I was there when the planet died. To see everything around you extinguished. It was as if I was blinded. It was as if the Force had been bled from the world. I was the only living thing remaining on the planet of Qatar. And my life, my agony, was a flicker in the darkness that was the planet. All that I had been connected to had been severed. It was not a thing done with machines or weapons. The Force is far more terrible, and it touches more lives than any machine can hope to slay. For everyone that feels the Force, strongly, Deeply. Each one feels and perceives it in their own way. You have strengths, and my master has his. His power is great, and it comes from hunger. He is a wound in the Force, more presence than flesh. And in his wake, life dies. He walked upon the surface of my dead world. The Jedi, the last council of the Jedi, came to our world to meet in secret. They hoped that perhaps among our people, they could achieve the clarity to see what was striking them from the darkness of the galaxy. They succeeded, but only in bringing him from the outer regions. And Qatar, with my kind, with the Jedi upon its surface, could no longer be ignored. And my people died, and the Jedi died, and there was no one left, only me. I still wonder what would have happened if I had died with the others. If perhaps there would have been some way to hide my presence from the galaxy. If only I had not felt that pain, that loss. But it could not be done. When the life was bled from the planet, somehow I remained. And there, lying in the bodies of my race, my master came for me. He took me for his own. And he made me see. And for the first time, I saw the galaxy. And I wished to die. He cannot deny his hunger for long. And any gathering of Jedi is something he cannot long resist. And now that the Jedi are vanishing, I do not know what will happen. Perhaps he will grow strong enough to eradicate all life, merely with his presence. I'm sorry for what happened to them, Thesis, but the only way we can avenge them is by dealing with your master. We should head for the bridge. Huh. That's a show on the decor of this place. Surrender now. Your ship is rigged to blow. <laughs> leave... Leave vices out of this. Your fight is with me. No. Do not harm him. I am the one. Who has betrayed you? I am the one who should suffer. I will return to you. But please, do not harm him. If you want to feed, feed off of me, Sith. I 
As you can see, I'm not quite your usual appetite. There are no Jedi here. Whoever told you that, lied to you. I don't understand. Who told you? Yeah, I was getting bored of talking anyway. she choose you? What makes you able to defeat me? Defeat me here? It is not possible to walk away from such things unscarred. To keep living when the universe dies around you. The Force is who I am. The dark side fills me. It is what I am. No matter how many I killed, there was no end to the pain. The blades the Force tore through my flesh. You have defeated me. Flesh and belief both cast down. Kreia, she will try to break you. To teach you how far someone can fall. Her weakness is you. As you are mine, I am glad to leave this place at last. At last you have arrived. Is Malakor as you remember? You no doubt have many questions. I would be a poor teacher if I did not give you the answers you seek here now. I never destroyed Atris. She had destroyed herself. I merely stripped away the illusion and brought her truth. Her teachings could not be allowed to continue. And like Malakor, she was part of your past, unresolved. She needed to be something you could confront and defeat one last time. It was part of your training. Part of what was needed to make you complete. And there must always be a Darth Traer. The galaxy needs its betrayers, especially in the times to come. She loved you, you know, as one loves a champion. You were all that she could not be. It is all that is left unsaid upon which tragedies are built. More echoes traveling through the Force. It is said that the Force has a will. It has a destiny for us all. I wield it, but it uses us all, and that is abhorrent to me, because I hate the Force. I hate that it seems to have a will, that it would control us to achieve some measure of balance when countless lives are lost. But in you... I see the potential to see the Force die, to turn away from its will, and that is what pleases me. You are beautiful to me, Exile. A dead spot in the Force, an emptiness in which its will might be denied. I use it as I would use a poison, and in the hopes of understanding it, I will learn the way to kill it. But perhaps these are the excuses of an old woman who has grown to rely on a thing she despises. From the moment you awoke, I have used you. I have used you so that you might become strong, stronger than I. I used your death to deceive the Sith, to make them believe they had won, so they would turn on each other. I used you to keep the lords of the Sith from condemning the galaxy to death with their power unchecked. I used you to lure them to Telos, where they could be at last fought and killed. I used you to reveal Atrus's corruption so that her teaching could be ended before it began. I used you to gather the Jedi so they could be destroyed. And I used you to make those who wounded me reveal themselves so they could be killed by the Republic. Perhaps you were expecting some surprise. 
for me to reveal a secret that had eluded you, something that would change your perspective of events, shatter you to your core. There is no great revelation, no great secret. There is only you, in times past and in times future. There are Jedi who will stop listening to the Force, those that will try to forget it but maintain unconscious ties, and those, as in the past, just as I, who have had the Force stripped from them. But no Jedi ever made the choice you did, to sever ties so completely, so utterly, that it leaves a wound in the Force. It was a mistake to try to make you feel it again, I see that now. There is no truth in the Force. But there is truth in you, Exile, and that is why I chose you. I have thought of this moment more than you know, and I wondered if here, at this ending between us, if you would care enough to try to save me, if a Jedi could find it within themselves to spare one who has fallen so far. I wanted you to say those words. For that I am grateful. But I do not want your mercy. I want you to break. Perhaps it is merely your perceptions of me that have changed. It is strange that you believe Malachor has not. But it has always been timeless to you, this place, and words have always been inadequate for the horrors that took place here. The apprentice must kill the master. If you do not, I will kill you. If I do not, then all you have achieved will be as nothing, as empty and as violent as Malachor itself. There is more than death in this galaxy, and you shall not find it easy. It was difficult to draw you here, but it had to be done. This place is your last test. It is the graveyard of the past, where you lost everything. It is the dark place in your mind that still echoes of failure. Now we shall see if you can overcome the weight of Malachor and silence the echoes that beat from its heart. <gasps> Finish this! Kill me! If you do not kill me, I shall end you. I died long ago, and now the circle is complete. Strike me down, and at last, end this. You have strength, but you have yet to learn the full extent of power. You will not show me mercy. I will see you break before you do. It is done. At last, it is done. You are greater than any I have ever trained. By killing me here, you have rewarded me more than you can possibly know. It is enough what you have done from now into the future. Many choices were there, but you made the right ones. I had hoped you would follow Revan's path, but you and Revan are different and your path is your own. You may take one of the ships that orbit Malachor and depart this place, or you may remain here on Malachor and wait for the others, those touched by the Force, who will come in time. Or you may return to your exile, where your presence will no longer affect the actions of others. There is no dishonor in any of these choices. I only ask that you make the choice without regret. <gasps> The centuries preceding the Great War were a time of peace and growth for the Republic. Dozens of new star systems joined the Galactic Senate. 
For the Sith Empire, however, these centuries were marked by a rapid acceleration in the preparations for war. An effort in which the Sith showed surprising cooperation and sacrifice. I have long suspected that during this extended period, the Sith spent generations infiltrating Republic political circles and even the Jedi Order. Reviewing historical records, I have uncovered strong evidence of one such case. Ezen Gint was a fourth-generation Jedi, widely considered to be the most promising Padawan in the Order. Having a similar heritage, the venerated Jedi scholar Master Barrel Overe took Gint as his apprentice. Together, Overe and Gint traveled the galaxy, studying the mysteries of the Force. Over the years, the pair became more and more ambitious, eventually undertaking a daunting mission. They set out to explore the ancient Sith temples on Yavin 4. Their goal was to investigate the final resting place of Naka Sadao, one of the most powerful Sith Lords who ever lived. Arriving on Yavin 4, Over and Gint discovered that Naga Sadao's twisted Masasi warriors had survived the centuries. The Masasi originated as a Sith subspecies, forming the backbone of the earliest Sith armies. But Naga Sadao subjected his Masasi followers to heinous experiments, turning them into dark force-wielding monsters. Gint and Master Over fought bravely against the Masasi, but they were defeated and forced to flee deep into the temple. There they encountered the dark energy still lingering in Naga Sadao's tomb. Weeks later, Master Over returned to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, alone, wounded and half insane from the tortures he had endured. After a lengthy recovery, Master Over told a tale of the horrors he faced and of Gint's tragic death. Several years passed. Then one day, Isin Gint mysteriously reappeared on Coruscant, wearing the garb of the Masasi warriors and bent on killing Master Over. Possessed by the dark spirit of Naga Sadao, Gint attacked his former master in broad daylight. The brutal battle between the two was staged, with all the Republic watching. Gint's borrowed powers were formidable, but Master Over won the day. Over's triumph over darkness was celebrated, and the Jedi Council assumed that all was well. The question no one asked was this. Why would Naga Sadao's spirit seek vengeance, specifically against Master Over? The answer has become clear after a closer look at Over's Jedi heritage. His father and grandfather also went out of their way to visit the tombs of the ancient Sith Lords. They were a family of Sith infiltrators. Over's mission on Yavin 4 was not for the Jedi. It was on behalf of his true master, the Dark Emperor of the Sith. The Emperor knew the spirits of the ancient Sith Lords could be a threat to his power when he returned to the known galaxy a century later. Over's trip to Yavin 4 was a preemptive strike. To seal Naga Sadao's tomb and ensure the Emperor's only enemies when he returned would be the Jedi and the Republic. How unfortunate that we've only learned the terrible truth about Master Over more than a century too late. Of course, this revelation only raises further questions. What other acts of dark subterfuge were Over and his family involved in? The onslaught of the Sith Empire was an event unlike any other in the history of the Republic. The Sith materialized from nowhere and launched an offensive of colossal proportions. Horrifying reports from the Outer Rim seemed to portend the utter destruction of the Republic. The rapid onset of galaxy-wide terror and panic was part of the Sith Emperor's meticulous calculations. His plan was flawless. Sith battlecruisers first appeared on the fringes of the Tingle Arm. Unaware of the ship's origins, we dispatched a diplomatic convoy with a small starfighter escort. The Emperor wanted us to witness the full might of his forces before he attacked. 
The diplomats had just enough time to transmit images back. Then they were annihilated. Immediately thereafter, the Sith began a full assault on the Republic allies in the Aparo sector, which fell before the Republic fleet even arrived. Then our allies turned on us. The Sith had secretly established puppet governments on Belkanah and Serpinal and Ruya. The Republic fleet suddenly found itself in enemy territory, fighting desperately on all sides. The Republic rallied every available ship to support the fleet, leaving only a handful of Jedi security ships to patrol Korriban. Regrettably, Korriban fell back into the enemy's hands without the Jedi Council even knowing about it. Overwhelmed and desperate, the Republic fleet scattered, fleeing from the Tingle Arm to avoid complete annihilation. Elsewhere in the Outer Rim, the Sith staged more targeted strikes, destroying our shipyards in the Slui sector, blockading the Rima trade route, and seizing control of the rich resources of the Minos Cluster. Confused and in complete disarray, Republic forces were unable to respond. Republic leaders and members of the Jedi Council arranged an emergency meeting in the Senate to prioritize the galaxy's defense. But the session quickly became mired in politics. Irate senators stormed out in protest over decisions which left their representative sectors exposed to attack. Many of the Republic's diplomatic allies refused military support for the greater cause. It was every system for itself. This was perhaps the greatest genius of the Emperor's plot. He had turned the Republic against itself. While the Republic played politics, the Emperor used the time to reconfigure his forces for the long push into the galactic core. All might have been lost in those early years had individual Jedi Masters and Republic military leaders waited for the Senate's orders. By taking matters into their own hands, they managed to slow the Empire's advances. The attack of the Sith Empire was the most well-orchestrated and carefully coordinated military maneuver in the galaxy's history. Indications suggest the operation took centuries of planning and preparation. When the Emperor planned the Republic's destruction, he did not foresee the need for alliances. The Sith would sweep through the galaxy, systematically exterminating their age-old Jedi enemies and dismantling the proud Republic. But the Emperor's vision was cynical. He did not count on the brave sacrifices the Republic's heroes were willing to make. After the Sith offensive seized the Siswina sector of the Outer Rim, the Imperial Armada turned its sights closer to the core, the Mid-Rim. Believing the Republic was still recovering from its heavy losses, Imperial forces charged into Bothan space, where they were caught off guard by the full force of the Republic fleet. The Republic fleet obliterated the Imperial squadron, and the Battle of Bathawui became the Republic's first major victory in the war. The news spread across the galaxy, rekindling lost hopes and re-energizing exhausted defenders. The Republic fleet moved on, but a courageous force of Jedi and Republic soldiers remained on Bathawui to await the Empire's return. The vengeance of the Sith came swiftly, Imperial battle cruisers from around the galaxy closed in on Bothan space to recoup their losses. A high-powered planetary shield protected Bathawui from bombardment, forcing the Imperial forces to engage on the ground. Jedi Master Belthalusis, seven dozen of the Order's finest knights, and 4,000 Republic soldiers dug in to defend the shield generators, or die trying. The disparity was staggering. An unprecedented Imperial army, 50,000 strong, descended on Bathawui's brave defenders. The defenders were undaunted, with no expectation of survival. They were mindful only of their duty. But overconfident Imperial commanders threw all their armies' might into direct assault and their ground forces fell in droves. For every Republic soldier who died, 10 Imperials were killed. The Empire was forced to call in reinforcements. Despite the defenders' determination, their lines were whittled away until only a handful of soldiers and Jedi remained. They rallied to the Jedi Master Eleusis for a final stand. Imperial Grand Moff Zelos offered to spare Master Eleusis if he and his brave comrades would surrender. 
Neither pride nor foolhardiness drove the defender's decision. They were guided by the Force. They had passed beyond the fear of death. Their glorious last stand will never be forgotten. Lucis and his men fell, but not before the Imperials were driven to retreat. The Battle of Bathawui was a draw. The heroes of Bathawui inspired bold New Republic strategies that eventually halted the Empire's advances. In retrospect, though, the Republic had lost too many systems in the early years of the Great War. The execution of the Emperor's brilliant strategy was flawless. Survival was the best the Republic could hope for. I've spent much time now piecing together the puzzle of the Emperor's initial designs. The arrival of Imperial allies in the Great War was a devastating blow from which the Republic never fully recovered. This was the second step in the Sith Emperor's master plan. Recent Republic strategic information reports proved that the rise of the Mandalorians was orchestrated by Imperial intelligence. We know extremely little about this shadowy organization, but Imperial intelligence operatives are clearly just as deadly as their Sith superiors. The galaxy's criminal networks wavered endlessly during the Great War, debating whether to back the Republic or the Empire. Although the Hutt cartels resented the Sith Emperor for not including them in his pre-war conspiracy, Imperial intelligence somehow blocked the Republic's efforts to win the Hutt's support. Scattered around the galaxy, Mandalorian mercenaries and bounty hunters faced the same choice as the Hutt's. Some signed on with the Empire, but most remained independent. Imperial diplomats made repeated attempts to recruit the galaxy's most infamous bounty hunters, but were turned down every time. The Empire shifted its tactics. Mandalorian mercenaries and bounty hunters often fought as gladiators for money and glory, a mark of honor in the Mandalorian culture. Imperial agents used this to their advantage, infiltrating the most prominent gladiatorial arenas in the galaxy as managers and sponsors, and even in some cases as gladiators themselves. The Imperial agents singled out a proud young gladiator to be their pawn. This young gladiator had always fared well in the arena, but with his new Imperial allies, his rise was accelerated to unprecedented levels. Rigging arena fights is not unheard of, but Imperial agents brazenly sabotaged the entire system by drugging their champion's competition. None could stand against him. The whispers of Imperial agents became cheers in the arena. Mandalore, Mandalore. The ancient title of Ultimate Warrior King was thrust upon the young gladiator. His infamy grew, and when he called, the Mandalorians rallied to their new master. The new Mandalore secretly served masters of his own, however. Imperial agents pulled their puppet strings, and the Mandalorian army blockaded the Hydean Way and challenged the Jedi. Though the blockade was eventually broken, the stage was set for the sacking of Coruscant and the uneasy truce which now paralyzes the Republic. The Mandalorian-Sith alliance remains intact to this day. That could change if the original ruse was brought to light, but the Imperial intelligence covers its tracks too well. Mandalore was slain recently, and his killer, the new Mandalore, has taken his place. Whether or not he's another Imperial puppet remains to be seen, but we must watch him closely. Imperial agent success in bringing the Mandalorians into the war was the counterplay to the Republic's first string of victories. Mandalorians. Trained from birth to fight in battle, their bodies are honed into killing machines. These independent warrior nomads have challenged the Jedi for centuries. The Mandalorians embrace conflict and admire strength, but they are different from our dark counterparts. They are not like the Sith. Mandalorians believe confrontation is required for growth, on the personal as well as the cultural level. War is the Mandalorian way of life. Combined with their thirst for conquest, it makes them undeniably dangerous. However, we must acknowledge that their commitment to self-improvement is not unlike our own. And there's even something respectable about their rugged sense of honor. But they are not our friends. The Mandalorian's allegiance to our enemies has cost us dearly. After the Sith Empire's initial onslaught, star systems continue to fall. 
until the Jedi finally managed to stop the enemy's advance in the mid-rim. For the first time in decades, the Republic Senate breathed a sigh of relief, but it was short-lived. In the arenas of Geonosis, a young gladiator had risen to prominence, calling himself the new Mandalore, a title unclaimed for centuries, a title reserved for the greatest warrior in the galaxy, a warrior worthy to lead the Mandalorians. Though it had been centuries, the descendants of the once proud culture had not forgotten the legends of the Mandalores who had gone before. Spread far and wide, working as mercenaries and bounty hunters, when the new Mandalore called, his loyal subjects came. Mandalore's call was simple, to confront the galaxy's greatest challenge and fight the legendary knights of the Jedi Order. Amassing an army overnight, Mandalore planted his forces in the path of the Hydean Way trade route, cutting off the Republic's most critical supply lines. We were initially hesitant to pull back from the battle with the Sith in the Outer Rim, but after several pleas from the Senate, the supply crisis could not be ignored. The Jedi Order answered the new Mandalore's challenge. We attacked the blockade. Our order was defeated quite profoundly. The Mandalorian blockade held strong until the day intrepid smugglers took their shot at the Mandalorians and managed to rescue the Republic. Mandalore went on to lead many of his followers to seek new challenges, while others again struck out on their own. The true enigma in the resurgence of the Mandalorians was the rise of the new Mandalore himself. The blockade choked the primary trade route for providing Republic military support to the Outer Rim and the main hyperlane for bringing raw goods from the colonies to the core worlds. Long-standing holdouts in the Outer Rim began folding to the Empire and critical supplies vanished from the core worlds almost overnight. As starvation swept through the lower levels of Coruscant, riots broke out planet-wide. Talk in the Senate veered sharply toward complete surrender to the Sith Empire. It was at this critical hour that a Miri Allen smuggler named Hilo Viz recognized an extraordinary business opportunity for her and her partners. With the Republic willing to pay any price for raw goods, Hilo's plan was simple. Break the Mandalorian blockade. Loading massive freighters with all the goods the Outer Rim had to offer, Hilo and her fellow smugglers hauled their loads to within a parsec of the blockade and stopped still. Distracted by suspicious freighters, the Mandalorians never knew what hit them. A motley fleet of small starships dropped out of hyperspace and opened fire. A massive space battle ensued. The smugglers' light freighters ran rings around the Mandalorian cruisers. But even so, Hilo Viz and her band were outmatched. Fortunately, Republic Strategic Information Systems was tipped off and starfighters were scrambled from nearby systems. With their assistance, the Mandalorians were quickly overcome. The blockade broken, Hilo Viz brought freighters full of raw goods into Carson and walked away with more wealth than she had ever imagined. An elaborate medal ceremony was held in her honor, but Hilo never showed. She was long gone. Rumor has it Hilo Viz was killed a year later for double-crossing the huts. Regardless, through this unlikely hero's efforts, the Republic war effort gained a reprieve. At the time, many believed the Empire was behind the Mandalorian blockade. My research indicates a far more elaborate explanation. Korriban, ancient birthplace of the Sith. We believed ruins were all that remained of their evil empire. I swear, I had no idea what was in those crates. I'm innocent. You were smuggling Sith artifacts, Captain. Fine, keep the artifacts. Just give me back my ship. Ice front. Just inspecting the troops, Corporal. Satil, what's wrong? I sense a, a great darkness. Sith Empire has returned. Ah! 
We must warn the Republic. Our shuttles can't outrun those fighters. <clears throat> well, guess who's got the fastest ship in the sector? Station defense is free. All hands evacuate. Look out! Ship, this is our fight. T seven, cut the iron cannons. <laughs> You must walk a different path. Escaped, Master. You failed. No, Malgus. This is only the beginning. Yes. After a thousand years, Korriban is ours again. Welcome home. For centuries, Alderaan stood as a beacon of hope in the Republic. But the Empire came. And with one savage strike, brought 
Time is running out, as few are left to face the enemy. For those that remain, there is but one choice. We must fight to victory or death for the Republic! <laughs> While the sacrifices are heavy, we fight knowing that a single spark of courage can ignite the fires of hope and restore peace across the galaxy. Three centuries after the death of Darth Malak and the end of the Jedi Civil War, the true Sith Empire returned from deep space, attacking the Republic. They began a war unlike any other in the galaxy's history. The Great Galactic War dragged on for decades. Thousands of Jedi and Sith were slain, 
countless star systems were ravaged. Though he now controlled half the galaxy, the Sith Emperor grew impatient. He had expected his triumph to come quickly. The Lords of the Emperor's Dark Council surprised the Republic's Senate with an offer of peace, a reprieve the Republic could not afford to ignore. Matters had become complicated for the Republic war effort since the critical trade route between the Outer Rim and the Core Worlds was recovering from the Mandalorian blockade. The Jedi Council urged caution as the Senate considered the Sith offer, but even they had to agree. The war was unwinnable. Peace was the only hope. Republic and Imperial diplomats convene on the planet of Alderaan to discuss a galaxy-wide ceasefire. But the Sith still had one play to make. Our time has come. For 300 years, we prepared. We grew stronger. While you rested in your cradle of power, believing your people were safe and protected. <laughs> you were trusted to lead the Republic. But you were deceived. As our powers of the dark side have blinded you. Assumed no force could challenge you. And now, finally, we have returned. <laughs> And now your Republic shall fall. The Imperial fleet launched a surprise assault on the Republic capital of Coruscant, bombarding the planet from orbit and storming the city world's bottomless towers. With Coruscant's defenses incapacitated, the Imperials annihilated the Jedi Temple, captured the Senate Tower, and held the entire planet hostage. Back on Alderaan, Republic diplomats had no choice. Despite unfavorable terms, the Treaty of Coruscant was signed. Jedi and Republic troops began withdrawing from battlefields around the galaxy, leaving star systems to fend for themselves and to be quickly swallowed up by the Sith Empire. 
The Jedi returned to Coruscant to find their temple in ruins and irate senators blaming the Jedi for all the Republic's troubles. Though still committed to defending the Republic, the Jedi relocated to their ancient homeworld of Tython to rest, meditate, and seek guidance from the Force. Thus began the unprecedented stalemate, the Jedi reconnecting with their roots, the Republic nursing its wounds, the Sith consolidating their power, and a galaxy divided between darkness and light. In retrospect, this outcome was inevitable and would have come sooner, were it not for some of the Republic's less savory allies. I will elaborate on this theory soon. In the following years, tensions between the Republic and Empire only grew. Despite the Treaty of Coruscant, both factions took every opportunity to undermine each other. The Empire annexed many defenseless worlds and encouraged others to openly reject their affiliation with the Republic while the Republic resisted their ancient enemies' aggressions as best they could. Jedi and Sith, spies and soldiers, even hired guns, all played their parts in the escalating conflict. After 12 years of tenuous peace, all-out war resumed between the Republic and the Empire. When the Sith Emperor Vitiate was seemingly destroyed by a Jedi, many hoped it would bring a swift end to the hostilities for good. Instead, various splinter factions hoping to fill the vacuum of power multiplied the number of battlefronts. Darth Malgus, long dissatisfied with the political maneuvering and backstabbing of Imperial leadership, led one of these fractured groups in a revolt, hoping to seize control of the Sith Empire. We meet again, Darth Nox. Welcome to my throne room. So much history. So many glory days that slipped away from us. The Emperor is dead. Long live the new Emperor. It is you who will bow to me, Malthus. Kneel. The Empire is withering away. Soon it will be obliterated by decadence and antiquated ideals. Yet still you struggle to keep it from healing, don't you see? Our survival demands a new Empire, tempered by alien alliances and strengthened by tolerance. You surround yourself with alien yes-men to bolster your confidence. But you're scared and weak, the traits of a doomed Emperor. Your perception is lacking. Emergency warning. Power core overrides engaged. Self-destruct initiated. Malgus the Betrayer, in the name of the Empire, I will destroy you. Die, or defeat me. Either way, the Empire is reborn. Malgus and his followers were challenged by the Republic and the Empire both, and he was presumed dead when his stolen space station was destroyed. But the damage he inflicted left the Republic at a considerable advantage, signaling a shift in the renewed war. Shortly after the fall of Malgus, the new leader of the Hutt Cartel, Taboro, conquered the neutral planet Makeb as the first step in a bid to expand the power of the Huts across the galaxy. Makeb was home to a resource known as Isotope 5, a tremendously powerful energy source Taboro planned to use to overthrow the Republic and Empire both, establishing the Huts as the galaxy's largest superpower. But Taboro's conquest of Makeb came with a price. His ruthless Isotope 5 mining operations destabilized the planet and set it on a path to total destruction. The Republic raced to evacuate Makeb's citizens, while the Empire sent their own forces to salvage as much Isotope 5 as they could in the chaos. Eventually, the other Hutt Cartel leaders turned against Taboro and offered to assist the Republic with eliminating him. As Taboro's invasion came to an end, the Republic gained a powerful ally in the Hutt Cartel, but the Empire's newly acquired supply of Isotope 5 made up for the shortcomings they had recently suffered. 
The chaos of Makeb had barely subsided before a new threat emerged. Despite fighting on opposite sides, a Sith Lord named Lana Benico and a Republic spy, Theron Shan, both began to suspect that their superiors were working together for an unknown third party. By pooling their resources and recruiting the help of some powerful new friends, Lana and Theron uncovered a conspiracy that was bigger than they could have imagined. The Republic and the Empire had both been infiltrated by a veritable army of cultists, led by the infamous Jedi-turned-Sith known as Revan. That HK unit you destroyed, you waited loyally for 300 years. I can rebuild him, but it won't be the same. Can't you see you're on the wrong side? The Emperor is death. For you, for me, for the galaxy. Listen to yourself. If you use the Foundry to exterminate billions, how are you any better? I'm doing this to save lives, not for glory. I will mourn for the dead and do what I must. As a young Jedi, I went to war. I accepted violence and darkness, and the Emperor called to me from across the galaxy. He made me a Sith Lord and named me Darth Revan. I killed for him. I turned on the Republic. But I have found redemption. 300 years ago, the Republic didn't know the Empire existed. How did you get the attention of the Emperor? I discovered hints of your Empire on dead lost worlds. Korriban and Malakor. The Emperor felt it, and he summoned me. I nearly destroyed the Republic, and that nearly destroyed me. When the Jedi returned me to the light, my memory was shattered. It took me years to track and confront the Emperor again. I tried to end him, and he murdered my companions and locked me away. For three centuries you've been steeping in hate. Now that you're free... All those years in his prison. I could feel him in my mind, drawing on my connection to the Force. But I was in his mind too, fighting him. Only I've been both Jedi and Sith and found clarity in the Force. Only I understand him, and his death is my responsibility. This isn't clarity, and this isn't your responsibility. There's another path. There was a time, a moment, when my destiny wasn't certain. That moment is gone. I've saved the Republic twice before. I've fought Mandalores and armies of the Dark Side. You won't stop me. This is station control to the Imperial fleet. The Foundry is ours. Fantastic news, my lord. We lost good men in the fleet battle, but we're mopping up the last of the Republic ships now. I assume the Jedi Master has also been eliminated. That Jedi Master used to be a Sith called Darth Revan. Yes. That's a matter we should discuss in person. As soon as we're secure, we'll conference with Darth Malgus aboard the flagship. You have my congratulations and my admiration. Fenir out. Revan has a fleet of warships on standby. Revan? But he was killed. We will stop Revan. We have to. Done pretty well for yourselves, but you're in the arena now. We fight for Riven! Your raid ends here, my Republic friends. The Revanites have claimed too many lives as theirs. Revan wants to reshape the galaxy, to save it. Knowing that the Sith Emperor Vitiate was not truly dead, Revan and his followers attempted to force Vitiate back into a physical form they could destroy by fomenting catastrophic battles between the Republic and the Empire. However, once their plan was exposed by Theron and Lana, a coalition of forces from both factions defeated the cultist's plot. But the victory was short-lived. Vitiate's incorporeal form spoke once more after years of silence, empowered by the very attempt to destroy him. The Emperor had returned. Ha 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 
What's happening? Impossible! The ritual hasn't even begun! The deaths you've caused, the war you've fueled, it is all mine! This galaxy is mine! It's time I claim it once more! Is everyone all right? We're fine. That was him. The Emperor. We stopped Revan. How is that possible? He did not assume a physical form or possess a body, and he left as soon as he appeared. None of it makes sense. Still packs a punch. <laughs> the General is entirely misinformed, Your Eminence. A few coats of paint, and I'll be ready for the Lunar Gala. Looks like we weren't the only survivors. I still don't understand. This looks like Revan, but so did the spirit. All truth is revealed with time. I've... failed. As have I. So many centuries. The Emperor and his dread masters trying to wrench me apart, to unleash my anger and hatred. I detached myself from the pain, focused on the Force. You hid behind Jedi platitudes. You weren't strong enough to survive the torture or the battle in the Foundry. I faced them. I survived them. You've carried on, dragging the remains of a body that should have long since faded to dust. Hatred fueled cunning, but burned out all wisdom. Without me, you could not see. Strength is useless without wisdom to guide it. We need to repair what the Emperor has done. I am whole again. But there is much to do. The Emperor has returned. Steel yourselves against what will come. Let's get back to base camp. He was right. We have a lot to do. A man can have anything. If he's willing to sacrifice. With your birth comes a solemn vow. You will have nothing. Your privilege is the dirt.
come with me. Son. Republic and Imperial forces joined together once again after the newly freed Sith Emperor consumed all life on the planet Zyost, killing almost the entirety of the planet's population. A task force led by Darth Marr, a key player during the Revanite Crisis, tracked the Emperor to an uncharted area beyond the known regions of the galaxy, known as Wild Space. Marr's forces had barely begun to explore the region before they were attacked. The assailants, led by Prince Arkin of the Internal Empire, captured Mar and one of his allies and brought them before his father, Emperor Valkorion. Mar immediately recognized Valkorion as the same emperor who had once ruled the Sith Empire and who had destroyed Zyost. Mar was killed in the ensuing confrontation. While Valkorion attempted to recruit Mar's ally to his cause, he was struck down and seemingly killed. Arkan blamed the ally, whom he called Outlander, for the attack and claimed the throne of the Eternal Empire for himself. The weakened Republic and Sith Empire were powerless against Emperor Arkan's forces and quickly submitted to invasion. Hope was lost until the Outlander escaped Arkan's prison and took command of the Alliance, an organization built from Republic and Imperial forces to shatter the Eternal Empire's grip on the galaxy. All the while, the disembodied Emperor, now known as Valkorion, lived on, speaking within the Alliance commander's mind, attempting to guide their actions and tempt them with promises of his power and wisdom.
Lance's rebellion was long and difficult. When Arkin was eventually deposed, his sister Valen, who many considered to be even more tyrannical, took the Eternal Throne for herself. Valen's rule, marked by bloodshed and chaos, ended when she attacked the Alliance base on Odessan. After a long battle that cost many lives, the Alliance commander defeated Valen, traveled to the Eternal Empire's homeworld of Zakul, and seized control of the Eternal Throne and what remained of the vast, automated fleets it commanded. It was at this pivotal moment that the disembodied Valkorian struck, attempting to seize the commander's body for himself. But the commander's will was stronger than he'd imagined, and the once Emperor of the Sith was seemingly destroyed at last. The Alliance's impressive influence over the galaxy was short-lived. Without a common foe to unite them, tensions between the Republic and the Empire quickly escalated. Meanwhile, a shadowy group known as the Order of Zildrog managed to secretly infiltrate all of the Alliance's systems and communications, ultimately destroying the bulk of the Alliance fleet before they were stopped. With a return to war becoming inevitable, the commander was forced to choose a side for the battles to come. The first shot of this renewed conflict was fired on the planet Osis, where Imperial forces were deployed to destroy a hidden colony of Jedi in a preemptive strike. The mission was ultimately led by Darth Malgus, who had narrowly survived his brush with death, and now seemed fully, if suspiciously, loyal to the Empire's new ruler. Is the man who once challenged the Republic and his fellow Sith alike truly returning to the fold as a loyal warrior for the Empire? Or does Malgus still have his own dark agenda? Focus, Sahar. <laughs> I did it! Did you see? Wow. I know it is difficult to accept, but the Force has chosen you.
Now give it to me. You could have saved my brother. What? Was I chosen by the Force? Or you? Now's not the time. <laughs> Do you know what it is your master just destroyed? Sahar, listen to me. A machine built to find those the Jedi didn't deem worthy. Silence! Give it to me. Now, Padawan! It's not too late. Give me the plans. No! We can still find your brother. I've only ever protected you. You must trust me. No! No!
will it hold him? Until he tells us everything he knows. He dies. Here I am. Come and get me. Pathetic. A fresh dig team will resume the work on Elon shortly. Malgus made quite a mess, but with luck, we'll soon know everything there is to know about Darth Null. If her inventions can be militarized. With our replenished Colto reserves, the Republic will have precious little hope left. The cell is satisfactory, Lord Eldred. I will share my appraisal with the rest of the Dark Council. Darth Savick should be cautious. You could be a marvelous contender for her position. With Malgus captured, what is next for the Hand of the Empire? I don't answer to you, Krovos. Pettiness doesn't suit you. You think this is over? revealed a truth long buried, a path to power concealed by thrones and hidden by councils, overshadowed by a war with no true victor. seen a vision of the future, a galaxy in flames. What I have begun will not end with me. This is only the beginning. Two and a half thousand years later, at the end of the Old Republic, the era of the legendary Darth Bane the creator of the Rule of Two and the last of the ancient Sith Lords came. Darth Bane, born Dessel and known to his proxies as Lord Edels, was the Sith Ari and the Dark Lord of the Sith responsible for creating the Rule of Two. Born in 1026 BBY, he was raised as a poor miner on the outer rim of planet Apatros. After killing a Galactic Republic ensign in a fight in 1003 BBY, Dessel was in danger of being arrested and imprisoned by the Republic. With the help of his friend Groshik, he escaped off-world to join the Sith Brotherhood of Darkness. Initially serving as a foot soldier in the Gloom Walkers unit, he was recognized as a Force Sensitive and taken to the Sith Academy on Korriban. Bane, as he had been christened, quickly became one of the best students at the academy before he lost his faith in the dark side of the force. Though Bane was able to regain his confidence in the dark side, he lost his trust in the Brotherhood of Darkness, believing it to be a flawed organization whose leader, Skir Khan, was a coward and a fool. Deserting the order, he went to the planet Lehon and studied the holocron of Darth Revan and armed with new knowledge, helped destroy the Brotherhood, allowing him to create his own Sith Order. He then instituted a Rule of Two, which stated that there could be only two Sith to avoid the infighting that had plagued the Sith for millennia. He also took the title of Darth and an apprentice named Darth Xana. In 990 BBY, 
Ten years after the destruction of the Brotherhood, Bane sought to learn how to create a holocron, through which he would pass down his knowledge to future Sith Lords. The Sith journeyed to the deep core world of Tython to locate the Sith holocron of the ancient Dark Lord, Belia Dazu. However, while Bane was on Tython, the Jedi Order learned of his existence and sent a group of Jedi to kill him and his apprentice. Once the Jedi arrived, they confronted the two Sith in Dazu's fortress. Though outnumbered, the Sith were able to defeat the Jedi. However, Bane was grievously injured. Xana took him to Ambria, where she convinced the healer Caleb to help them. Caleb notified the Jedi Council, only to have Xana use her powers to drive her cousin Daravit insane. Xana killed Caleb, then hid herself and Bane. When the Jedi arrived, they killed Daravit, believing him to be the Sith Lord. Thus, the Sith were believed destroyed. A decade later, Bane began to worry that his apprentice was too weak to overthrow him and assumed the mantle of Dark Lord of the Sith, as was necessary under the Rule of Two. He began to research the secrets to prolonging his life by transferring his essence to another body and travelled to Prakith, where he claimed the holocron of the ancient Darth and Didu. After returning from Prakith, Bane was ambushed by a team of assassins hired by Caleb's daughter, Sarah, and was captured. Taken to Doan, Bane was imprisoned and tortured, only to covertly gain his freedom soon afterward. Encountering Xana on Doan, Bane dueled his apprentice, who sought to become the new Dark Lord. The fight ended in a draw, with Bane escaping and heading to Ambria with Darth Cognus, an Itochi assassin skilled in use of the dark side whom Bane planned to take as his apprentice if Xana proved herself weak and unworthy. There, Bane and Xana engaged in a fateful duel that resulted in the death of the Sith Ari and Xana claiming the title of Dark Lord. Bane tried to initiate the ritual of essence transfer but failed to control his apprentice's body. Part of Darth Bane's soul lived in Xana's body after the failed ritual but the majority of his spirit was thrown into the void, causing him an eternity of suffering. Nearly a millennium later, Bane's Sith Order defeated the Jedi Order and overthrew the Republic. His holocron still imparted wisdom through the years. This is where the era of the Old Republic ends and the era of the High Republic begins. You can watch a film about this era by following the link in the description or by clicking on the icon on the left.